Welcome to Healthcare Du Jour, where we dish up and digest the latest in healthcare. For the next 30 minutes, sit back as we bring you insight, commentary, and discussion on trending topics to the table, all expertly served up by our host and his guests. Healthcare Du Jour is brought to you by Carium, the telehealth platform enabling healthcare's digital transformation, helping you care for people within the fabric of their daily lives. Now, here's your host, Matt Fisher. Welcome back, and thank you for joining as we dive into the hottest topics in healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Fisher. On the menu today is Brian Harris, CEO and co-founder at MedRhythms. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Matt. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. So, Brian, what I always like to do at the start of each show is give my guests more of a chance to provide an introduction in terms of who they are and what they do. Uh, so the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much for that, Matt. Uh, uh, by training, I'm a, my background is as a board-certified music therapist, uh, and I specifically have advanced training in the neuroscience of music and uh, specifically how that can be clinically applied to help people recover from neurologic disease and injury. So using music to improve things like movement, language, uh, and cognition. Um, and uh, my clinical journey started in, in actually in Boston when I was a clinician at Spalding Rehab Hospital in Boston, um, which is the Harvard Medical School affiliate for neuro rehab hospitals, where I was treating patients primarily with stroke and brain injuries, um, helping them improve primarily the, their ability to improve walking. And we were finding that patients were getting better faster with greater results. And we now had neuroscience that we could explain how these results were possible and how uh, we could replicate them. And so very quickly after I started that program there at, at Spalding, uh, the demand for my services, both from physicians who were seeing the outcomes and writing orders for me to see their patients within the hospital, but also from patients and their family members who were saying, you know, Brian, you helped my dad walk again. How do I get more of this when I leave the hospital? And at the time, the answer really was, you know, there's nothing you can do. And that was an awful conversation for me to have with patients and their family members on a regular basis. And so really based upon the, the results that we were seeing in the clinic and the demand that we were seeing, um, I co-founded MedRhythms as a way of really thinking about this fundamental mission of how do we bring this important care to everybody around the world that we believe need it and fundamentally deserve to have access to it, all based upon the power of music to maximize brain health. So before diving into exactly what is music therapy and talking about how it provides the positive impacts you're just talking about, um, I'm interested, what got you into music therapy or healthcare in the first place? I grew up uh, as a musician first and loved music. It was a big part of my life and knew that it was going to be a part of my uh, professional career. I also knew that uh, music education was not a path that I, I was uh, wanting to take and that the performance route uh, of being a musician was exciting, but not something that I really had, I think, a strong pull to. But when I heard of the idea of music therapy before even understanding what it was, um, the idea of using music to help people was something that uh, was very compelling for me. And I was uh, in uh, my undergrad at the University of Maine, and I was able to take a class on music therapy and, and to understand really what it was. I fell in love with the content. But really, the, the life-changing moment for me was when I witnessed music therapy for the first time um, with a boy uh, who was about 18 years old, who was uh, cognitively and physically functioning at about one-year-old level. She had severe developmental delays. And I watched a music therapist work with him. Um, and within about the first 10 minutes of being uh, uh, in the presence of live music, this boy began cognitively functioning at a higher level in terms of his ability to open his eyes, interact with his environment. So at a higher level than what anybody in his life had seen before. So literally his family members and the people that worked with him every day were sitting in the room in tears because they couldn't believe how this boy was responding to music. And it was at that moment for me that I knew that A, that this was my calling in life, that I needed to be using music in this way to help people. But also there must be a reason why his brain allowed him to respond that way to music. And while this was what we would consider to be a magical response in, in many cases, there must be an answer to this and there must be a reason why. And if we can answer that question, then that's really when we can harness the power of music and replicate it to help a lot of people. And that was really the point in my life where I uh, said neuroscience is the path forward for me and figuring out how, uh, how to answer that question. Yeah, so kind of to help answer that question, what exactly is music, music therapy? Yeah, so music therapy is quite a broad profession in general. Um, it has been around since about the mid-1950s as an established healthcare profession. It's delivered by uh, board-certified music therapists. So you can think about it 
much like um, physical therapy or occupational therapy or speech therapy, except the mode for change is music. So it's delivered by a clinician to a patient. Um, and it's really used across the board from uh, children and early uh, education settings. We're working on behavioral goals. It's used in hospice care at end of life. It's been used in NICU settings for uh, uh, premature babies. It's been used in psychiatric hospitals. But more so with the advancements of neuroscience and neuroimaging uh, technology, in about the, the late 1990s, so 1999, um, was a part of music therapy was formed that's called neurologic music therapy, which is all based purely on the neuroscience, objective research of how your brain perceives and produces music and how that can be used to improve outcomes for those living with neurologic disease and injury. And that's where my specialty lies, is really in that intersection of neuroscience and music. So you know, when you're going through a course of music therapy, what, what does that treatment course look like? Well, it largely depends on uh, the, the diagnosis and the outcome that we're focused on. As it relates to what we do a lot at, at, at MedRhythms is really focused on using music to improve walking. And that really comes down to neuroscience and how our, our brains perceive rhythm. So when we hear rhythm that repeats in our environment, like the rhythm in music, um, it's been shown that it activates our auditory system because it's an auditory input. But our auditory system and our motor system are richly connected subconsciously such that when we hear this external rhythmic cue, the auditory system and the motor system begin to fire in synchrony with that external rhythmic cue. And that's what we call auditory motor entrainment. This is actually the reason why when we listen to music, we want to move along to it. Um, and also, I would encourage you, if you ever want to take a, a, find a song that's about 105 beats per minute, try to walk to the beat of the music. It's going to be very easy for you to do this as a healthy individual to walk to the beat of the music. And then I would encourage you to try to not walk to that beat of the music. And it's almost impossible for a human to not walk to the beat of the music that's in their environment because the rhythm is literally activating the motor system, telling it to fire. Now, those who have damage to the motor system, Parkinson's disease, stroke, MS, traumatic brain injury, it's been shown that we can use that external auditory cue to engage the centers of the brain around the motor system to help it improve uh, the way that somebody walks who has a neurologic disease and injury. And what the research then shows is that over time, that engaging in music, so engaging in this type of therapy, can actually aid in the process of neuroplasticity. So can actually help the brain to create new connections or strengthen old connections over time. So a really powerful stimulus. And, so, and is it fair to say, kind of, as you're talking about, you know, that you know, using the rhythm and naturally trying to match it, is that something that's happening happening subconsciously, um, or is there some level of conscious uh, effort connected to it as well? Yeah. So the it, the research shows that it's a subconscious process. So actually, in order for this synchronization of the auditory motor system not to happen, you have to come up with some sort of cognitive uh, uh, interference. So you actually have to think about something else when you're listening to music to not walk along to it, because it's a, a very rich subconscious process, which is why those uh, patients of ours that may have cognitive deficits can still respond to the uh, intervention, because it does not rely on a conscious process to think about moving along to the music or changing the way that we step it's purely the rhythm is driving the outcome from a neural level. So kind of to drive the, the focus on, you know, the music that you're utilizing at the moment, you know, how is it delivered? You know, like, are there special types of headphones or you know, kind of how is it you know, ideal to be listening to the music? So we've, we have developed a, a system that is a hardware software combination where we have sensors that connect to the shoe that collects clinical grade biomechanics in real time. So we get all sorts of data about how fast somebody's walking, the angles of their foot while they're walking, their, their symmetry, their variability. That feeds into our algorithm, which is based upon a mobile device. And then the music is delivered via headphones. So uh, we have a very complex, uh, what we call our clinical thinking algorithms, which is essentially I taught the algorithms how to respond to the data coming in from the shoes about how somebody's walking with music. So that's really at the core of what we do is our, our clinical thinking algorithms. But the music, the experience to the patients 
is actually the, the, the patients are listening to music that they're familiar with or that they like. We recently uh, did a partnership with Universal Music Group, which is the world's largest record label. And part of that partnership is access to their content. So what we can actually do is take uh, songs that people are generally familiar with across genres, pull it into our algorithm, and then essentially make it therapeutically valuable for the patients to walk walk to and improve uh, the, you know, uh, or, or increase things like their cadence and these types of things. It, it, which kind of triggers a question for me of, are there particular genres or types of music that are more impactful uh, than others? Well, what the what the research shows is that uh, there's we think about music through the objective and the subjective lens. When we think about music objectively, we know that there are certain uh, types of uh, rhythmic structures that are needed. We need certain um, uh, 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 tempos. We need certain beat salience. So how well defined the beat is in a song. Groove is helpful. So thinking about that sort of uh, the groove that we might experience. Certain time signatures are necessary objectively. But then the research shows that your brain functionally responds better to music that you like. So enhancing outcomes if you do this intervention with familiar music. So we try to marry those two things together to say, can we find music that has the objective parameters we need to elicit auditory motor entrainment, but have the experience of that music, ob ob objective parameters of music be familiar songs? So typically we find that, you know, Motown, classic rock, these types of songs, popular music is typically well primed for this type of intervention because it naturally has some of those characteristics. Yeah, no, and that's very interesting because it's, you know, probably helps to open many more, many more doors and maybe people come in expecting because thinking maybe, oh, maybe, you know, it's only certain types of music that are going to be utilized. But as you're saying, if you can actually tap into what each individual likes the most and, you know, kind of identify songs or, you know, a whole host of albums or, you know, kind of whatever the selection is that will help drive the outcomes that I imagine that also helps to the engagement because, you know, kind of, as you're saying, then you're picking something that they'd already want to be listening to anyway. And you make a great point there, Matt. I mean, I think that's uh, also critical to how we think about development is we also need to have products, particularly in healthcare, that people want to use that are engaging, that are motivating, because without doing them, you don't get the clinical outcome that we're trying to deliver. And so we think that having familiar music and this experience that actually may in fact be fun um, will be important for helping people to adhere to how it's recommended. Yeah, and I don't know if there's any research around it, but I guess you know, even beyond the adherence of it, if it's fun, if you're finding the experience fun and enjoyable, does that also help reinforce the positive outcomes that can be developed through the intervention? Yeah, it's very interesting because even when we, if we back up and we talk some about some pretty specific uh, elements of neuroscience as it relates to music, but if we look at a higher level, when we listen to music that we like, um, that just passively listen to music that's in our environment, doesn't matter what it is, if it's familiar music, it engages the parts of our brain that are responsible for movement, language, attention, emotion, memory, executive function across the board. And there's no other stimulus on earth that engages our brain like music does. And this is an objective response to, to uh, music, regardless of age, culture, ability, or disability. Everybody's brain responds the same to music. So when we think about that, that just neural activation is peaked when we listen to music that we like. And then we think about a walking intervention. Certainly it helps with it, you know, it should help uh, with adherence and motivation, but also we think that that global activation of your brain also helps to certainly reinforce the outcomes that we're, that we're looking for. Yeah, no, I think that's very fascinating. And for those of you just joining, I'm talking with Brian Harris of MedRhythms and we're talking about music therapy and the benefits of interaction or the intervention. And, you know, Brian, we've been talking kind of a lot about, you know, what music therapy is and how it's delivered, but I'd be kind of a little bit interested in finding out, you know, what are some of the, you know, the neuroscience underpinnings for it? And, you know, what are some of the changes that get observed? You know, I think you were talking about, you know, brain elasticity and, you know, retraining 
pathways to recover from, you know, from an external damage source, whether it's a stroke or a disease progression. So if you could talk through some of that, you know, the, the science aspect of it, I think that'd be really cool to be able to understand like how it is helping to retrain the brain. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, and as I said, these advancements in neuroscience and neuroimaging technologies have begun to allow us to answer these questions uh, more specifically. And, you know, as we focus on just this topic of, of thinking about music to improve walking, uh, starting at a high level, as I just mentioned, it's been shown that our brains are activated in the presence of music, unlike anything else uh, on Earth. So there's this diffuse global activation when we listen to music. It's also been shown that engaging in music, so this could be learning an instrument, it could be singing casually uh, in the car, uh, in a choir, whatever that might be, the engagement of singing, um, or engaging in the interventions that we provide as clinicians, that the engagement of music aids in the process of neuroplasticity. So for, for the listeners out there, neuroplasticity is essentially the principle that demonstrates that um, your brain can actually strengthen old connections or create new connections throughout our entire life. That's the reason why we can learn new things as we age. It's also the reason why people who have brain injuries like stroke, traumatic brain injury, et cetera, can heal is because our brains can make these new connections. And so when we think about it activates our brain like nothing else and that it um, it uh, aids in neuroplasticity, that's why it gives us such a novel way to help help people and such a, makes it such a strong healthcare stimulus. Then when we dive back into um, to, uh, uh, the, some of the more neuroscience about movement, it's been shown that when we do purposeful movement to music, that it actually can change white matter pathways in the brain. So actually strengthening neural connections between different aspects uh, or different regions of the brain, demonstrating that the engagement in music is actually having a, a, a fundamental impact on brain anatomy, which is what makes it so uh, so compelling. And to determine that with the, with the imaging, are you kind of taking before and after and you know, a continuous stream throughout the course of treatment of images, or is it possible to do any kind of live imaging as a person is going through a therapy session? So the research that exists to date, and just to give some context here, the intervention that uh, we've essentially built with our digital therapeutic and our, our next generation neurotherapeutic is based upon an intervention that's called rhythmic auditory stimulation. And rhythmic auditory stimulation has been studied in the lab setting for about three decades, demonstrating its efficacy to improve functional outcomes as it relates to walking. And so now what we've done is built a way to deliver rhythmic auditory stimulation autonomously without the need of a clinician present. So the research to date on this area has been primarily neuroimaging, thinking about things like fMRI, DTI uh, approaches. What we get excited about is the next generation of, of imaging to be able to answer some of these questions uh, like uh, what's happening in real time as somebody's walking to music, which to date has not been answered yet, but uh, nor has the technology really allowed that to be answered, but we're getting close to that now. Yeah, so I guess kind of picking up on what you just mentioned there, you know, how are digital therapeutics evolving the, the ability to deliver interventions and you know, building upon that, you know, the evidence basis that you've just been talking about? Yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting uh, time as we think about the field of, of digital therapeutics and how it's evolving um, over the last even 10 years, where we were seeing a lot of things like digital health applications, and we were seeing um, some, some great products around CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, really looking at behavior change. And now we're starting to look at uh, products like the ones that we're building, where we're actually using the software or the technology to deliver active stimulation to the, 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 the human brain and really thinking about um, how exciting that is from two per perspectives. One is certainly access and scale. With technology, we can reach a lot of people with, with uh, uh, m uh, these focused neurotherapeutics, but also our brains are shaped by experience. So what we see, what we hear, what we feel shapes actual pathways in our brain. And there's a really unique application uh, and a novel application and an important application of this type of external stimulation that can only be delivered via technology, e.g. the delivering of music. However, what also gets exciting is we're getting real-time data inputs as somebody's walking. 
So the fidelity of data that we can collect about how somebody's doing in that moment and over time that can inform care um, is really exciting as we think about the next generation of healthcare and how that can change how healthcare is delivered and the, the potential impact of the therapeutics on the patients that we serve. Yeah. And when you're looking at that real-time data, what for you know, what data elements are more important than others or kind of what what are you ideally looking for? Well, I think there's sort of two answers to that. I think there's what we need in order to deliver um, uh, an intervention, which is real-time uh, data. I mean, we get data up to the you know microsecond data about somebody's steps and how they're actually doing in the moment because we need to understand that to deliver an appropriate intervention. But I think there's also the data that can be collected over time um, that can be fed back either to patients or, or potentially to providers as well to help inform both how somebody's recovering, but potentially, you know, we think about our products, but also other digital therapeutics and neurotherapeutics that are out there um, now as well, thinking about how that can be used to inform the care pathway and care delivery of the person's total care, not just uh, that one intervention. And that's really, I think, the beauty of of uh, sort of these next generation neurotherapeutics is the the amount of data that it can provide to help inform the right care at the right moment for these patients over time. And kind of with that reference to neurotherapeutics, is that a distinct category or a subcategory of digital therapeutics, or maybe like a mixture of both or something else entirely? Yeah, as we think about that, I mean, neurotherapeutics is not a new uh, statement, uh, you know, or, or, or category by any means. You know, neurotherapeutics is really a, uh, you know, if you take those two words together, it's a therapeutic for the brain, right? Which over time, there's a lot of forms by which neurotherapeutics can take place. As we think about what we're doing and calling ourselves as, as next generation neurotherapeutics, I mean, we're really taking novel technology and a novel mechanism of action in, in the music and delivering the therapeutic in a completely different way. As you think about, you know, people, uh, uh, and a lot of new companies in the world of digital therapeutics, right? We have some conversations around, you know, it, it's important to point out that they're called digital therapeutics basically just because of how they're delivered. They're delivered digitally. But the therapeutic aspect is just as strong as other therapeutics. And so using that as a qualifier is really just to describe the mechanism by which it's delivered not the sort of outcome or, or efficacy that we might achieve. And so it's a it's a new industry that we're seeing growing over the last 10 years. And it's it's an interesting time now because I think also if there's anything that demonstrates the need for any level of remote healthcare, it's a global pandemic. And so I think we're seeing the the demonstration and from the the world at large that why these types of products are so important. Yeah, and kind of pointing out that you know, not I, I don't know if distinction is the right word, but kind of pointing out how the different words interact with each other. Kind of, as you said, the therapeutic piece is something that is based on evidence and has like, you know, has existed for a period of time. And the digital part is really the, to a large degree, the means of delivering a, ther a therapeutic in a, in a different avenue. But do you see, you know, maybe an overemphasis on the digital part of it or, you know, introducing the digital part, having, you know, any impact on hesitancy to utilize the therapeutic in that form? Well, that's a loaded question, Matt, I think, because I think it depends on who we're talking about, right? And I think that for there's some people that would hear digital therapeutic and say, oh, it's a therapeutic that's not a drug. I like it, right? Like there's there's an inherent, I think, approach to there. I think there's other people that could make that same statement, but potentially have not the same uh, response. It's a digital therapeutic. Can it have the same outcome as a drug? Is this just an app that you download, right? What does this actually mean? And I think there's also this, you know, it's a new industry. There's a, a, a part of advocacy and education that needs to understand, like, what does this term actually mean? And how is it differentiated from things like digital health? That's a very broad category. You know, what is the, how is this different than a Fitbit and a tracker and a health tracker and these types of things? But I think what we're finding is that um, as we're growing as an industry, those lines are becoming more clear about evidence-based products. As we think about digital therapeutics, these are products that go through rigorous clinical trials like drugs. They are regulated by FDA and they are prescription products. So for us, it's really less about the digital 
and more about the therapeutic. And, and we use this term neurotherapeutics a lot for that purpose as well. I mean, we are de developing um, important interventions to uh, impact the brain to treat a disease should matter that is delivered via software. Yeah, and kind of, as you just mentioned, you know, having to go through an FDA review process and, you know, the rigorous nature of that is something that I feel is not necessarily always recognized or discussed. Because as you said, it's, it's, you know, almost too easy to lump digital therapeutics in with the broader category of digital health. And, you know, th as you said, think about it as, you know, a consumer wearable or, you know, all these, you know, or, or a mobile app that proliferate, proliferates on, um, you know, the App Store, the Google Play Store. Um, you know, so, you know, I think as you just said, that, that FDA um, process is an extreme, extremely important point And, you know, it kind of underscores the fact that these aren't things that have just popped popped up overnight. Yeah, and you know, it's also demonstrating that, you know, there's we're treating a disease. That's why it's important, right, for for regulation, but also demonstrating that there is a level of evidence that supports this um in a very uh sort of rigorous way that there's data that supports that interventions can work. Um and I think that isn't that's an important in the distinction of what makes these different from more general digital health uh and not to say you know as a as we have this conversation there is a place and importance to digital health applications and trackers and these types of things. That's really important. And they, 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 they uh, certainly have value to people's lives. This is just a, a different um, place for the intervention and a different type of value. Yeah, kind of, as you said, they all have their place. And, you know, I think kind of implicit in what you're saying is as we go through and refine our understanding of, you know, how each of these interventions can be utilized, you have to go through that refinement process so you can get the you know a better understanding of the benefits that can be derived and when and how to apply them and have patients um, and care teams interact with them. Right. I mean, part of this, as we think about even the full commercialization spectrum here, right? There's the the regulation as you talk about, also understanding how we can best make an impact to the patients that we serve. Number one, it's ensuring that the products have clinical efficacy, right? And then as we think about delivering it to patients, it's ensuring that they can safely be prescribed to the right patient at the right time under the orders of a doctor. So there's a pathway there. But then there's also how can we leverage reimbursement as well? We fundamentally believe that access, and when we use that term access, um, Sometimes we think about geographic access, but we also think a lot about health equity. Everybody that needs an intervention should have access to it. And the only way that we believe that that happens is through third-party reimbursement across the board from public and private payers. That it, they should be and need to be reimbursed so that patients can have access to it. And going along this uh, rigorous process through, through uh, uh, evidence generation, FDA regulation is important to that full picture of seeing the mission realized. Yeah, and I think kind of that, that point of access and equity and being able to have, have a rigorous full picture process is a, a great point to take away as the final point, because um, unfortunately, believe it or not, we are already out of time. Um, I want to thank my guest, Brian Harris, for a great conversation today. Well, thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for having me. It was uh, an honor to be here, and I appreciate you uh, helping tell the story. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you to everyone listening. Keep the dialogue going and connect with me at hashtag HCDE. J-U-R-E. I'm Matt Fisher. Until next time.